our Bible study. Welcome to our Bible study. Today is June 9th. Uh, open your Bibles, please, to uh, uh, John chapter 16, Yohanan Ishtasar. Let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence with a heart full of thanksgiving. You have given us yet one more day to be on this earth, and may it be that we will glorify your name as we meditate upon your word. May your word uh, be placed into our hearts so we can understand it and we could live by it. And may your word give us light into our ways and give us wisdom into how we live upon this earth. Heavenly Father, we pray for our friends that cannot be here tonight. May it be that you will give them rest and health as they are um, as they are meditating upon you we pray in the name of jesus amen so open your bibles to john chapter um, 16 uh, we have a topic of holy spirit conviction that i started two weeks ago and last week we did not have a bible study so i apologize for that i want to read to you uh, four verses from verse 7 through 11 john 16 from verse 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus is saying, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So as we meditate upon this part of the scripture, we want to talk about what is Holy Spirit conviction, and we read the verses. And last time we talked about the fact that salvation, salvation is is is, is living, uh, is a living union with a living God. We need to understand that before we understand Holy Spirit and the conviction of Holy Spirit. We need to understand that salvation is a living union with a living God. Uh, our God is alive. And when we are saved, we have been united uh, into him by the power of Holy Spirit. And salvation is also a new birth. Uh, we have been born from above. We have changed. God has changed the way we think, the way we talk, the way we walk. And he has given us a new birth. And salvation is really a true knowledge of a true God. Now, a lot of people think they know God. Uh, they say, my God uh, versus your God. But really, salvation is a true knowledge of a true God. Do you know the true God? Do you understand him? Uh, do you do you see him in the scriptures as you read and meditate upon the scriptures? And we also talked about salvation is life and nature of God restored unto us. We lost our life when we sinned. We, Adam was was created a perfect being, and when he sinned, he lost the, the life and God had to give him uh, a new life. You and I, when we sinned, we lost our, 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 our lives. We, we are born physically and we will be dead physically, but God has given us eternal life. And that is very important. And what happens and when we are saved, God restores that life into us. God returns that that uh, pleasure we had with him in the Garden of Eden into us. He restores you back to where you were 
before you sin. And so that is why salvation is very important. Then we talked about the fact that um, if we miss Holy Spirit, if we miss that conviction of Holy Spirit that comes into your life, we will be missing repentance. We will not repent. And we said and read a lot of verses that how we repent, it is the conviction of the Holy Spirit in us that makes us repent. And if we miss repentance, if we don't repent, we will miss faith because when you repent, that means you have faith. And that faith is come from reading the word of God. And if you miss faith, if we miss faith, then we miss Christ. We will not believe, and therefore we will miss Christ. So it's very important for us as believers to know that the Holy Spirit conviction is very important, very important. Because if he does not convict us, we will miss repentance. And if we don't repent, we will not have faith. That means if we don't have faith, therefore we don't have Christ. And so it's very important uh, for you and I to see the necessity of the Holy Spirit conviction. So first we talked about salvation and what salvation is. Second, we talked about how important it is for us to be convicted of Holy Spirit. And also the other thing we talked about is that when we talk about Holy Spirit, we need to, and the conviction of Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit conviction um, is not just the fact uh, that you and I realize that we have the inability to reach our goal. That is not the conviction of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit doesn't convict you, and then um, you say, well, I am not able. I am, I am a sinner, I, uh, and, and I feel bad, and I feel convicted, and I, and I break down. That's not how it works, right? It's not the goal. That is not the main goal. It happens, obviously, Holy Spirit awakens us to our nature. We, we then repent, and then we have faith, and then we have Christ. But, but is, that's not the end goal of Holy Spirit conviction. The end goal of, um, of the Holy Spirit conviction is to bring us to Christ. You see what I'm saying? It does, he doesn't leave us. Holy Spirit doesn't leave us just in a state of, oh, I have, I have uh, fallen short. It doesn't leave you there. What it does is awakens you and brings you to Christ. That's very important. The end goal is for the grace of God, using the Holy Spirit to awaken us to our inability that we are sinners that we cannot please God without faith. And it brings you and I to Christ. So when people talk about Holy Spirit, the question is this. Do you rest in the law? Do you, are you satisfied with the fact that you have had an experience only? Do you sit on the mourner's bench and just weep and weep and weep? Do you rest in those things? And I can tell you the answer should be no. because we have to rest in the bosom of Christ. Jesus says, come unto me, all, all of you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so the conviction of Holy Spirit, as he awakens us to our nature and our inability, it doesn't stop there. He takes us, he brings us to Christ. He brings us to Christ. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some key points. And before I get there, I just want you to listen to me. There, there, there are th four things that are important, but we, before we get there, I want you to just, uh, if you don't mind, just listen to me carefully, carefully. Now, a man may be a chosen vessel unto the God, like Saul the Tarsus. You remember Saul the Tarsus? that became Paul. A man may be a chosen vessel unto God like Saul of Tarsus, but that man is not saved until he comes to faith in Christ, until Holy Spirit brings him to Christ. 
Paul wrote in Ephesians 2. He said, we were children of wrath as others. We were fulfilling the, the lust of our flesh. We were fulfilling the desires of our mind and the lust of our eyes. That's what we were doing. We were following the prince of the power of the air. Just like everybody else, he said, this is what Saul, Paul is writing. And God, he said in Ephesians 2, and God made us alive. You see, that's what we were. But God quickened us, made us alive. God awakened us. And God brought us to faith in Christ. That's when we were saved, my friends. Although Saul of Tarsus was a chosen vessel of God, but until he was broken and brought to Christ, he was not saved. That's when we were saved. When God made you and me alive and changed our citizenship from darkness into light. And then a man may tremble before the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? A man may tremble before the holy law of God. Right? You read the law of God. You may tremble like Israel trembled at Sinai when the law of God was brought down by Moses. But that doesn't mean they're saved. You see what I'm saying? But until... That man who trembles by the holy law of God, until that man is brought to faith in Christ, to receive Christ, he is not saved. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit conviction does. Starts the work in you, but completes it by getting you to Christ. He may be a chosen vessel. He may tremble before the law, but we must be brought to rest in Christ to trust in him, to enter into him by faith, and the by faith that is imputed into us by Christ. A man, a man may hear the true prophet of God. You may go to church, you may listen to radio. A true preacher of God, he may hear the true preacher of the gospel, like the Ethiopian eunuch who heard Philip, right? Philip. But a man is not restored. He is not saved until he rests in Christ or until he comes to a saving faith. Then a man may undergo deep personal conviction of sin, like the publican in the temple who cried, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. But that man is not saved until he rests in Christ. It's very important that we do not stop at point one. We need to make sure that we have been brought to Christ. Very important, my friends. You see, election or conviction or the preaching of the gospel, or an experience of mourning over sin is not the end, it's just the beginning. Those are the means of grace, follow with me. Those are means that God uses to bring us to salvation. That's not the end, it's just the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And that brings you to rest in Christ, where is your assurance? Is it in the works that you do, or is it in Christ? Do you rest in Christ? Do you rely on him on everything? Christ is our salvation. And we must never stop short of, of a willing, of a loving, continuing faith in Christ. We must never stop short of a willing, loving, continuing faith in Christ.
That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in saving God's people. He's bringing us to rest in Christ. That is Holy Spirit conviction, my friends. Has he brought you to rest in Christ? Paul said something about that in Galatians 1.15. He said, God, now listen, Galatians is right before Ephesians. God, Galatians 1.15, God who separated me from my mother's womb. That's what Paul says. God who separated me from my mother's womb, but I wasn't saved from my mother's womb. And called me by his grace. I wasn't saved by Holy Spirit's call. He was pleased. Now here it is. To reveal his son in me. And that's when I was saved. When God revealed himself in me. Although I was called. Although I was chosen. And separated from my mother's womb. But, you know, salvation came when God was pleased to reveal his son, not to me, not for me, but in me. That's important. You see? Oh, now, that's when I came to assurance and confidence. That's when I came to rest in, it. that's when I came to rest is when God revealed his son in me, and I came to rest in Christ. I came to trust him because only cross, Christ can justify us before God. Christ only can cleanse and put away our sins and our guilt. Only Christ can free you and me from the curse and penalty of the law. Only Christ can speak peace to our troubled soul. Only Christ can make us acceptable and robe us in his righteousness. Only Christ can seat us in victory at the right hand of God. Only Christ. And that's what the Holy Spirit conviction is. Is uses all of these mechanisms to bring you to rest in Christ. I want to lay that foundation before I get to answer in the answering of this question. What is the Holy Spirit conviction? It is essential. It is vital. It is necessary. Holy Spirit conviction is not the end, my friends. It is not the goal. It is not the object of a work of grace. The goal and the end and object of a work of grace is to bring you and me to rest in Christ. Don't forget that. To trust in Christ. To believe in Christ. And to live in Christ. That's what Holy Spirit Conviction is. All right. Let's look at our text again. In John 16, 7. In John 16, 7. Let's look, our, look at our text again. The Lord Jesus said, It is expedient. That is, the word means it's essential or it's necessary. John 16, 7, it is essential, it's necessary for you that I go away. Now, in these verses and in others, when our Lord talks about going away, what is he talking about? He's talking about his death. He's talking about a crucifixion. He's talking about dying on the cross. That's what he's talking about. I must go away. It's necessary for me to die. That's what he's saying. He said over there in uh, John 14, verses 1 to 3, John 14, 1 through 3, he said to the disciples, 
they were troubled. He said that to the disciples and they were troubled. He told them he was going away. He was going to be killed. And they were troubled and filled with sorrow. Do you remember that? And he said in John 14, 1, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not, so I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. By his death, that's how he prepared heaven for us. Have you thought about it? The only way he could have prepared heaven for you was by his death. He had to depart. By dying for us, by cleansing our sins, by making us gods a son, by justifying us before the holy law and righteousness of God. And then in John 16, 5, he said, I go my way unto him that sent me. So when our Lord talks about going away, he is talking about his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection. And his going away, his death is necessary for about four reasons. More than that, but here are four that I'm going to give you. His death is necessary for about four reasons. There's much more, but I want to share with you four. First of all, his death is necessary. Why? He goes to open for us a way into holiest a wall, into the presence of God. His death is necessary because he will open the way for us to go into the presence of God. Very important. We have no way onto the presence of God except through Christ. What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, where? No man what? No man cometh to the Father but by me. That is the way to God. It is by the way of the cross. You follow? So the reason that Christ's death is very critical, number one, is to open a passage for you and I, the way. So you and I can be in the presence of God. Christ has gone to the cross to make a way for us into the holiest of all into the presence of God. Secondly, and then he goes away, that means to the cross, to take possession of heaven in our stead, to enter in and possess the land for his people and preparing a place for us. He is there now. He is in the possession of heaven. And he is preparing a place for you and I. That's what he's doing. He has, he has taken possession of heaven in our stead, preparing a place for you. Thirdly, then he goes to the Father's right hand to intercede for us. That's why he had to die not only to open the way for you to go into the presence of God, not only a way for us to prepare a place for us in heaven, but he died, so he is now sitting at the right hand of, of the Father, interceding for you and me. Christ is our intercessor. He is our advocate. Or we could say he is our lawyer. He pleads our case. Who would do that 
if he didn't die? Who would plead your case? He presents his wounds. He presents his blood. And he presents his obedience. He pleads not our merits. He doesn't say, oh, look, look, look. Look at that person. Uh, look how good they are. Look what they're doing. No, he doesn't. He does not plead in heaven our merits. He pleads his merit, what he did on the cross on my behalf. He pleads not our righteousness. He doesn't say to God, oh, look, look, look at that, my son. Look how good he is. No, he doesn't plead our righteousness. He pleads his righteousness because he is perfect in heaven before the Father. So he goes to intercede. And the last important point, then he goes away to make an effectual atonement for us. One old writer said, he's gone to transact all saving business between God and the sinner. He is gone to transact all saving business between God and the sinner. That's what he is doing. Now notice the next thing in verse 7. Notice the next thing in verse 7. He says, it is expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, that means if I die not, the Holy Spirit will not come. The Comforter will not come. Now, this is a fact. And if you will think about it a moment, you will see how true it is. And it is a very easy to understand. Christ said, if I don't go away, that means if I don't die on the cross, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. Now, there, here is the reason that Holy Spirit will not come. He said, if Christ doesn't die on the cross, if Christ does not honor God's law, if Christ does not honor God's justice and satisfy it, then there is nothing for the Holy Spirit to come to do. What would he do if he come? If Christ didn't die, what would Holy Spirit do? How can he comfort you when there is no comfort? How can he comfort you if Christ didn't die on the cross? How can he comfort us of our eternal life, salvation, hope, when there is no hope, right? So he has nothing to bring if Christ didn't die. He would have no gospel to reveal to us. If Christ didn't die. He would have no blood to sprinkle. If Christ doesn't die. He would have no salvation to apply. If Christ didn't die. He would have no righteousness to reveal. If Christ does not die. So it's very important for us to understand. That by the death of Christ. Holy Spirit will come. But if Christ never died. Holy Spirit would not be here. He would have no comfort to give. Why have a comforter if he cannot comfort? Well, then our comfort is that Christ died for our sins. That's our comfort. That is the comfort, and that's the only comfort that you and I need to be comforted with. Christ Jesus puts away all of our iniquities and reconciles us to God. That's our comfort. That's what the Holy Spirit is comforting you today. He said, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. There is no reason for him to come if Jesus Christ did not die. But when he comes, he says, but when he comes, and my friends, he has come. Why? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross. But when he comes, 
he will convince the world of sin. Now, what is Holy Spirit conviction? We kind of talked about it. Perhaps it's better for me to say, what is not the Holy Spirit conviction? Not what it is. What it is not. What is not Holy Spirit conviction? So to eliminate some false uh, thinking or teaching. Number one, well, Holy Spirit conviction, I know this. It is not just the troubling of the natural conscience. That is not Holy Spirit conviction. Not just. That's not Holy Spirit conviction because every man has a conscience. Do you know that? And yet, every man has a conscience. Every man's conscience is troubled to an extent, to a degree, when he does something bad. Every person's conscience is troubled. So this special regenerating, awakening, quickening, Holy Spirit conviction is not just troubling the natural conscience. You know, God says that he has written his law upon the heart of every man. Every man knows when he does something wrong. My one-year-old, two-year-old, your two-year-old knows when they do something wrong. So Holy Spirit conviction is not just um, troubling the uh, conscience. Secondly, Holy Spirit conviction is not just a head knowledge of the fact that sin is wrong. You know, a lot of us have a head knowledge. You know, killing is bad. We know it. We know it. It is not just the head knowledge. It is not just to be convinced that sin is wrong. A lot of people know sin is wrong. I think that just about everybody knows sin is wrong. And so that's not only, that's not Holy Spirit conviction. If a man says, well, I know sin is wrong, well, that doesn't mean that you have Holy Spirit conviction in you. That doesn't mean Holy Spirit is in you and is drawing you to Christ. I expect everyone to know sin is wrong. Because the Bible says, God has written his law upon the heart of every man. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit conviction is not just to give a, a sense or a mental agreement to what the Bible says about sin. Some people really listen, but it only is in their mental being that they relate to sin, not in their heart. I think that just about everybody would do the same. Give a mental agreement to what the Bible says about sin. I think that everybody knows it's wrong to kill. Everybody knows it's wrong to steal, to curse, to lie, to bear false witness, to commit adultery, to take God's name in vain. Most people know right from wrong. So this is not Holy Spirit conviction. Just because a fellow knows he's a sinner, just because a fellow knows that the Bible condemns sin, and just because a fellow knows right from wrong, does he really have Holy Spirit conviction? Not necessarily. So what is it? I want to show you a few things and we will end. First of all, True Holy Spirit conviction leads to repentance and leads to faith and leads a sinner to rest in Christ. We talked about this already. True Holy Spirit conviction leads you and I to repent, to faith, to rest in Christ. It is, a, it is to personally, individually, to feel and experience the bitterness 
and the wretchedness of my own guilt and I, my own sin. Now, it is one thing to know that vinegar is sour, to know it in your head. It is another thing to taste it. And that's the difference in real Holy Spirit conviction and nominal law conviction. Under the nominal law conviction, we know that sin is evil. Oh, yeah, I know. But when Holy Spirit convicts you, oh, you have tasted that vinegar. You know how terrible that sin is. You see what I'm saying to you? Somebody may say, oh, I know salt is no good too much on the food. You can say that. But when mama makes food and all of a sudden there's too much salt, Oh my gosh, you cannot even eat it. Samila. You see what I'm saying to you? For when the Holy Spirit does a work of grace in a man's heart, he doesn't only know that sin is bitter. He tastes it. He feels it. He experiences it. He personally is made aware of the bitterness and the guilt of sin and the exceeding sinfulness of it, Paul said, of sin. And he is brought where? To rest in Christ. You see, that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit conviction. Secondly, Holy Spirit conviction is a real sense of the fact that my sins are not just against my fellow human being, but they are against God. Now, most everybody knows that they have done this person wrong or that person wrong or another person wrong, but Holy Spirit conviction reveals the fact that my sins are against God. You know what David says in Psalm 51? Lord, my sins are ever before me. Because you have awakened me. You have convicted me with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, against thee and thee only have I said. Oh, you see what happened? That conviction doesn't stop there. It says that my sins are not against just another person, but against you, God. I have sinned against you. What did the prodigal son say to his dad? I have sinned against the heavens. And thirdly, the real Holy Spirit conviction is a real sense of justice and righteousness of God in condemning and punishing my sin. This is important. You may not understand it as I read it quickly, but one more time. Real Holy Spirit conviction is a real sense of the justice and righteousness of God in condemning and punishing my sin. Let me ask you some personal questions here, and you'll know what, whether you are, you have understood this or not. Now listen to question number one. Do you think God is justified if he condemns me or judges you and casts me or you out of his presence, is he justified to do that? Would, would he be just? How do you answer that? Would God be just if he says, Ramil, leave my presence? I will judge you. Is he just? Does he owe me heaven? Of course he is just. Because I know one thing. That I'm a sinner. You know why? Because Holy Spirit has convicted me of sin. And has brought me to rest in Christ. I know that God doesn't owe me heaven. I know that. I haven't earned heaven. So when God comes and says, I will judge you, Ramil, 
I will not be able to say, no, no, you're wrong. You need to take me to heaven. I know how bad of a person I am. You know why? Because Holy Spirit has convicted. Secondly, do I deserve to be an object of God's wrath or object of God's mercy? Which one? Which one I deserve to be? Of course I deserve to be an object of God's wrath. That's what I've earned. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Peanut butter sandwich? No. The wages of sin is death. I have earned death. That's my paycheck. And I ought to be eternally in hell. That is what Job said. Lord, behold, I am wild. I am wild. That's what Isaiah said. In chapter 6, he says, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what David says. Oh God, against thee have I sinned. That's what Peter said. Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You see, believers know who they are because they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. Very important. So if we, we are convicted of Holy Spirit, we have a real sense that the justice of God and righteousness of God has to fall upon me and I am on my way to hell, but thank be to God that he has made me alive and he has brought me into his rest. You see what I'm saying to you? That's very important. Very important. If you're an object of Holy Spirit conviction as a person, if you are an object of Holy Spirit conviction, God will show you your sinful nature. That's right. He will show you the nature of sin. That's the root of sin, the nature of sin. And that's the thing within me which produces the products of sin. It will show it to me. And then he will not only convince me of the root of the sin and the nature of sin. That's what Paul is talking about Romans 7 when he said, I find the law present with me that when I would do good, when I would do good, evil is present. And when I would do good, I find the law, warning against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to sin. That's the nature of sin with which I was born. And that's very important. Not only that, but Holy Spirit convicts, convinces us of the totality of sin. It tells us, guys, that our righteousness is not enough. We need something else. It brings us to Christ. Please, I beg you, don't just feel good about the fact that we mentally know something or we, not, we have seen something, but we need to experience the presence of Holy Spirit when he convinces you of sin and brings you to know Christ. That is so beautiful. That's what our Lord is saying. When the Holy Spirit has come, he will convince men of sin and of righteousness because I go to my Father. He will show you the only way you and I could be right with God is through Christ. The one that died because he's gone away, he's in heaven. Now Holy Spirit will tell you the only way you can be right with God is through the blood of Christ. Is it possible for us to see the facts of what the Holy Spirit has done in our life? Has he, convinces, has he convinced you of sin? Has he convinced you that there's only one righteousness as he convinces you, has convinced you of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. Someone says, I know my sins are pardoned. 
I know my sins are put away, yet I feel in me, in my being, the motions of sin, and yea, the presence of sin. Will Satan someday rise up to condemn me? No, he has been judged. That's what the scripture says in John 16. The prince of this world is judged. He has no bearing on you anymore. He will not get up and judge you. He will not get up and take you because now you and I have been brought to rest in Christ. He has been judged and he has been put away. I hope the lesson, you find it important in your Christian walk. And may it be that we don't just pause based on an experience or based on something mental, but we really get through the scriptures and have the Holy Spirit take us to know him and reveal him, like Paul says, in us. Very powerful lesson. May God bless us as we close. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it is such a blessing to know the Holy Spirit conviction. It is such a blessing to see that the only way we will be convinced is when you died and you went to heaven. And now we have a path to be in the presence of God because you are there preparing places for us. And you are there as our lawyer advocating on our behalf. Heavenly Father, may it be that we would rest in you, not in what we have done, or not in what we will do, but in what you have done. Amazing, amazing grace. How beautiful it is. We thank you and we praise you because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God